Hey everyone, it's so good to be back. My name is Erica Zazo and I am the chapter leader of Mappy Hour Chicago and generally just plugged into the Mappy Hour community. Um, today I'm super excited to talk to Julie McGuire. She is a skier and a back, specifically a backcountry skier in the Catskills in upstate New York. So we're really excited to bring her on today and learn about her journey and falling in love with skiing and some of her interesting things about her life as well as tips for you all if you're interested in skiing in the Catskills. A few things before we get started. Just a quick note if you're watching on mappyhour.org or on Facebook on any of our pages that we're live streaming, please be respectful in, in the comments, kind to each other, and leave questions for Julie as well. Uh, we'll be answering those at the end of the Q&A. Also, today is special. We're donating all of the donations from viewers who choose to donate to today's event on the mappyhour.org site to an organization called She Jumps. It's a nonprofit for helping women and girls get outside and feel comfortable doing so. And actually, Julie was someone who brought it up to us that this would be a great organization to support um, um, today. So we're really excited about that. Also, thanks to our sponsors, Sierra Nevada Beer, who we love dearly, and also Fat Map, which we'll talk about later. Uh, two great sponsors for today, and we're excited for, to tell you more about them. And without further ado, I just want to introduce Julie. Uh, she, as I mentioned, is a backcountry skier. She's an educator based in, uh, based in New York City um, during the school year and actually right now up in the Catskills teaching remotely. She has a lot of passion around the power of nature to help someone heal, uh, as well as learning how to backcountry ski and turning not only into a beginner, but now a mentor for many in the community. So please bring on Julie, Sarah, and we're excited. Hey there. Hey, good, good evening. evening. Good to see you. Um, thanks so much for spending time today. Um, just want to really kick it off with getting to know you a little bit for people who might be listening and know you already, and also for people who might be hearing you for the first time. So why don't you introduce yourself? Uh, okay. I'm a born and raised New Yorker. So I grew up in Queens. Um, I have an apartment in New York City. Um, but my parents back in the 80s, they bought a house in the Catskills and we used to go up every weekend. And so, you know, that's why I'm here in the Catskills in this house, though they no longer use it. Um, it's really just me that uses it. And that's kind of nice. So uh, <laughs> yeah, it's really nice. Like I have a house that I don't have to pay for. Um, I'm also um, a public school teacher in the South Bronx. I'm a high school English teacher. Um, yeah, and I've been teaching remotely. I've had medical accommodations to teach remotely. So I've been kind of based up here, even though I'm still paying an egregious amount of rent in the city. Got it. And how, is, how has that been for you? You know, are you um, looking forward to summer and, and, and how has remote teaching been? Just no need to go into too much detail, but we're just checking in on you mentally. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I mean, it's definitely, there. There's, there's pros and cons. I would say that the awkward thing is when I'm teaching remotely, but there are students that are live in the classroom and they're not remote. That is a really awkward situation because uh, you don't really have like control and you know, you're not there. So it's like, how do you really manage things? So that, that's where it gets awkward. When everyone's remote and we're all in the same playing field, it's all good. Yeah, so much transition and like relearning and learning, I have to imagine. So while well, we yeah. thank you for your public service through teaching <laughs> by myself. Thank you. Don't know if I'm up for it personally, but we really <laughs> are happy that we have people like you willing to teach um, teach the youth across the U.S. Um, great. So I want to learn a little bit more about you know how you ended up in New York City and specifically how you got into skiing after living being a, a city dweller. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. So. I kind of almost don't understand why my parents bought a house in the country because they are not outdoorsy people at all. Um, I feel like they would just kind of like come up here, mow the lawn and like cut, you know, like cut the grass and, you know, clean the house and like, then like we'd go home. But uh, they wanted us to be successful when we grew up and they thought successful people ski and they play tennis. So they would take me maybe a few times a year to go skiing when I was a kid. Even though we only lived like 15 minutes away, you know, they would only take us a few times a year. And then like, I went to school in DC and I didn't really ski. And then um, I kind of picked it back up again in my late twenties. 
after like this big breakup. And I was like, oh, I haven't gone skiing in a while. Let me go skiing. And then that is like what kicked off my obsession with uh, skiing in general. And then backcountry skiing, uh, that was something that I picked up in August of 2018. Uh, after my divorce. So skiing has always been, I guess since adulthood, kind of like uh, a way of, of healing from things. Yeah, that's interesting. Like, is there something that drew you to go out into nature through some of these like probably harder times in your life? Is it the solitude? Is it distraction? Um, do you feel calmer out there? Like I myself try to get out in the trail when I need to just like not look at the screen and just de-stress a little bit. But what was that journey like finding out that that was really helpful or something you needed? Um, hmm. You know what? It, it's funny, at least with uh, backcountry skiing, I felt that that was the opposite of a distraction. I felt like that was really kind of like immersing yourself in the mental anguish and facing it and also adding some, you know, physical um, pain in there as well, because, you know, climbing uphill can be um, physically exhausting. So um, what happened was like, I, I already, I always saw like backcountry skiing kind of was like the next evolution, but my ex-wife wanted to stay on the resort. So after we broke up, um, I saw this advertisement for this women's camp through Powder Quest and it said no experience necessary. And even though I had zero desire to do anything, like I literally just wanted to die, I, um, I was like, all right, well, this is too much of a coincidence. Let me book this trip. And so I booked the trip. It was um, a backcountry ski tour in Chile. And so I booked it maybe like in May or June. And at least it gave me something to kind of like, like a project to kind of focus on. Like, all right, well, now I need to get this equipment and I need to, you know, figure out how to use it and stuff before I go. Because I like to be prepared. I don't like to like live on the edge like that and like show up unprepared. So uh, I did that. I showed up. I loved the backcountry skiing. Um, and then it kind of like took off from there. And I felt, I don't know, I just felt like compelled to keep going, you know? So I would like wake up at 5.30 AM on weekends, you know, and I would skin up the resort. And, you know, as I was doing that, you know, I would kind of like think about, you know, everything that went wrong. And it was kind of like that, that physical exertion you know, kind of like matching like your mental anguish and it's very cathartic, you know, kind of like breaking things when you're angry. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then things kind of, you know, just progressed from there. So, you know, I did like four continents in, you know, three years. I did the Haute Root Alps where I, I skinned and skied from, you know, uh, Chamonix in France to Zermatt in Switzerland. Oh. I skinned the resort every single weekend. Uh, then like I, I had a guy teach me more about um, like navigation and stuff. And that's why I fell in love with Fat Map. I took my area one and two, and then I was hiking, you know, to find backcountry zones and and yeah, I just became like obsessed with being in the outdoors and, and definitely exploring the cat skills because that was something I could do on my own without needing somebody because I'm not an avalanche terrain. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I just, I truly feel that, you know, when you're in nature and you're climbing or you're walking or doing something that, that you love, that you will transform, you will gain insight into things, you will gain wisdom. And I think people always see these things as like some sort of like, you know, a hammer hits you over the head moment, but it isn't, you know, a lot of transformation and knowledge acquisition and, and wisdom and things are, are subtle things. And, and I feel like, you know, especially since COVID and I got to live up here for a year and really even up the intensity even more that I, I, I really believe that. And that's why I'm so passionate about getting people into the outdoors because I feel like it's, it's, been such a tremendous life-changing experience for me. And I think everybody should have access to it. Yeah, that's really amazing that it sounds like it's almost been like a blend of both solo kind of driven inspiration, but 
clearly backcountry skiing takes some knowledge and some, you know, learning along the way. And it sounds like you might've been tapping into some communities of people mm -hmm. or other skiers and resources um, like the fat map um, resources you mentioned. So how much has, how much has, of have other female skiers and women in the outdoors influenced you at all? Um, is there a community up in the Catskills of women that you look to, or are you kind of out there both on your own because you're out there skiing on your own, but also maybe even, you know, as a, a female skier? Um, let's see. So the camp that I do with Powder Quest, and I, I've continued to do that camp during the summers, uh, that's a women's camp. And so I met like, Rachel Burks, uh, she's a big mountain skier. Jess McMillan, who's won more uh, like big mountain competitions than any male or female. She generally runs, or she's like the star guide, you know, at the at the camp. And I mean, that's a wonderful community. Um, but aside from when I see them, and we all keep in touch, like you know, and, and a lot of us like go back and we're returning members. Um, in terms of the Catskills, the Catskills isn't exactly known for backcountry skiing. Um, yeah. We don't get a lot of, it's very inconsistent snowfall. And I just feel like I've been like particularly blessed this year. I've been like working remotely, but we've also had an insane amount of snow for the Catskills. So it's it's really allowed me to go out and explore. I, I sometimes see like women skinning up the resort. I have not seen anyone i know there are women that like you know will we'll do like some excursions into the backcountry in the catskills but in terms of like a, a regular basis or, or like i don't know who they are if they're out there <laughs> i would i would love for them to get in touch with me if they are i i seem to be i'm sorry say it again calling all catskills females yeah yeah exactly i mean you know <laughs> reach out to me um it, it seems that i'm kind of like for now like out there the most but i would like to bring others out there um i mean i know the fun places to ski but because we've gotten so much um snow this year i was taking advantage of trying to like ski as many of the high peaks as i can and that's a lot of type two kind of uh experience especially the downhills very like thick vegetation and and stuff like that that you have to maneuver through the uphill is a lot easier than the downhill in a lot of cases um but uh but still i think it's an adventure and i love that i can practice the things that i learn on big tours and stuff like that here mm -hmm. so um so type one fun is like type one is like the whole you know experience is pleasurable type two fun means that there's some like struggle or um fear or suffering you know, during the event, but you're kind of glad that you did it afterwards, you know, mm -hmm. and, and that's kind of like the the type of adventure that I like the most. Type three is like, you never want to do it again. Like that was horrible. <laughs> so type two is kind of like the zone that I like to be in, but we all need some type one fun, right? To keep things right. fun. But uh, like my after work tours are type one fun. Yeah. My weekend tours are type two fun. I like my vacations to be type two fun. Yeah. So. Yeah. That's awesome. That's a great way to look at it and probably healthy to have a mix of them all yeah. um, for your body and for your sanity and everything in between. Um, one thing that you mentioned, you mentioned the Catskills aren't necessarily known as a backcountry ski kind of hub. Um, I'm also curious too, like if you want to elaborate on that at all, feel free, but also, you know, skiing in general, it, you are such a vulnerable, willing um, member in the community who speaks out about your experiences, not only personally, but maybe even just what you're doing on the trail. And I know you're involved in some communities online, on Facebook groups and things like that. So um, skiing you know, in, in the industry, like, can you talk a little bit about that lack of vulnerability or why you're doing that um, and charting that different type of path for skiers? Um. I mean, in terms of vulnerability, in terms of sharing things about my personal life, uh, I mean, that I'm like the least self-conscious about because I think everybody likes to hear that you can go through something uh, in life where like you're just so broken that you literally just want to end your life and like you don't want to go on and you can find a way 
to build yourself back up. And, and I think that gives people hope. Mm -hmm. So I mean, uh, people want to say anything negative about that. That's fine. I don't care. That doesn't bother me. Um, vulnerability in terms of like sharing like my adventures. I mean, I'm, I'm out there. I don't think any experience is like beneath me <laughs> um, or anything like that. I just, I do what I can and what makes sense to me when I'm out there. And I'm very open about um, like what I encounter, how I handle obstacles. Um, just cause I think that one, I mean, it helps me synthesize things when I write about it, right? Like as a learner. Um, mm -hmm. And then also maybe it gives other people maybe some insights or maybe they experience some sort of like similar obstacle and maybe they'll be like, ah, oh, you know, I read this chick kind of like, you know, decided to keep her skins on on the way down, you know, in the frozen trench and that helped her out. Maybe I should try that or something like that, you know? Um, so I just see it as a way of, you know, maybe people can learn from it or, you know, occasionally sometimes, you know, people may be like, why don't you try this? Okay. If it makes sense, I'll try it. But I mean, I don't know. I, I, I just see it. I don't, it doesn't make me self-conscious to share things like that. Yeah, it's a great quality. Um, I'm sure people appreciate it a lot. I mean, I do reading your posts on Instagram. Oh, it's a good <laughs> kind of escape for myself too. And I'm sure other people just to hear about your experiences. So uh, really, really inspiring and cool. Yeah, I think we're, we're like, you know, I mean, especially like, people have been very divided with things like politics and things like that. But you know what, skiing and beer, I mean, you know, that everyone enjoys that, at least that are in those communities and in the groups that I'm posting in. So, you know, yeah. it, that can be like a unifying uh, a thing, you know? Yeah, you mentioned beer, so my mind's already elsewhere and thinking about beer now. Um, I am a beer drinker here in the Midwest too. Um, can you talk a little bit about your love of IPA? Because I I know from you posting and and, and through the grapevine that you are a, a IPA enthusiast. What is your take on beer and skiing and the combo? Because I know so, you have a unique journey there. Yes. So, you know, like a lot of times uh, people have beer, you know, like when they summit something or like afterwards, like they do the apre thing. And right. I think I kind of, uh, I figured out, I think this was like when I was like hiking during the summer, I was like, you know what, um, why don't I have the beer now, like at the beginning? And, you know, one, you know, it, it, it prevents you from bonking. Like it, it really, like it absorbs super quickly. You know, if, if you're on something that's like a really long tour, you kind of like don't want to get to the point where you're already feeling depleted. Right. So beer absorbs quickly. It also, I mean, I'm going to, I love my double IPAs, right? So I'll have like one of those and it gives you that mood boost when you're like skinning up, right? So having kind of like, you know, like that, that, that mood boost and having the carbohydrates kind of makes things go, you know, faster and more pleasant. Um, then when I was like doing a lot of the high peaks and I realized how miserable like the downhill could be, um, then I started having it, you know, at the summit. Cause I'm like, all right, I think I need the mood boost for the way down. Um, <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, I, I actually, you know, I've convinced myself that this is a performance enhancer. So long as I, <laughs> I drink in moderation and you like, I generally only have one beer or if I feel like, oh, it's an empty, like I carry like a thermos with me. So it's just like, you know, all right, I'm feeling it today. We're going to put some of this in here and drink it later, you know? Um, <laughs> And it's also like, then it's like a longer period of time from like bottle to throttle too. You know, like I, I'm a responsible person. So that's another, that's another reason. But I mean, no, I actually feel it helps uh, my performance. Got it. Do you have, is it as simple as just throwing beer in your bag? I know you mentioned the thermos, but um, ski poles are sharp and things are sharp in your backpack. Crampons are sharp in your back. Yeah. So. <laughs> uh, if you can, you can uh, put, actually, uh, I actually just had that experience. For some reason, I've been able to keep like ski and boot crampons with the beers in the same like pouch. And I and I just had that experience like this past week where I'm like, ah, it, it punctured and it uh, I have to go wash my backpack now. It smells like a frat house. But uh, but yeah, if I would I would recommend you put it in a separate separate pockets, you know, if you can. So 
Yeah. Cool. Um, I wanted to jump back really quick to what we were talking about just before the beer conversation, which was um, being vulnerable and, and specifically community skiing. And obviously there's been an uptick in skiing and interest in out, getting outside with, with COVID and the pandemic. Um, do you have you seen more of people out on the mountain and do you think that will continue into next year? And, and how has that kind of changed uh, over the, your time of being a skier in Catskills? I, I feel like uh, backcountry skiing is something you either love or you hate. So if you've taken to it this season and you liked it, it's not something that you're going to stop. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's uh, so, and yes, there's definitely been an uptick, even just in those that are skinning the resort. I mean, it used to be like, you know, like the same kind of like group all the time that you would kind of like see on the skin track in the mornings. And, uh, you know, now it's like, there's a lot more traffic uh, on the skin track, um, you know, in the resort. Um, I feel like I'm trying to think in the actual backcountry, have I seen more people? I know there's been an uptick in people like, you know, trying to get out there even in the Catskills, um, but I still, it's, I don't feel like it's crowded. It's not like when you go to like, you know, some of the places like in Vermont or like New Hampshire and it's, you know, crowds of people, you mm -hmm. know, uh, backcountry skiing. You know, I, I still think that like, you know, the Catskills isn't exactly where people flock to for that. Yeah. And how did you learn about Catskill skiing? I mean, you grew up there, obviously, but learning about uh, you grew up going there, but the learning of how to ski, backcountry ski in the Catskills, uh, what is that? What what was that learning experience like in the journey, finding your routes and things? That that was all about hiking in the off season to try and figure out um, what I might want to ski. Uh, and I did. I became a thirty five a Catskill thirty five hundred club member. So you have to like you know uh, hike all of the um, high peaks in the Catskills that are on this list. So I did that uh, over the summer. Um, and then I also actually the fun stuff is actually on the lower peaks. Uh, mm -hmm. there, there, there's some, there's some fun stuff on the higher peaks or at least like there are parts, but, uh, it's more ski friendly if you explore the lower peaks. Um, but that was just, that was just me out there exploring and like applying things that I'd learned in like my area one and two and, and, you know, um, research and just like my big trips. And I, I feel like, you know, it's funny when I was talking to like Jess McMillan and stuff and, and I was talking about the high peaks and the cat skills and, and I mentioned how like they're 35, she actually like dead ass laughed in my face. I mean, we're like, we're like friends. So it was, you know, it wasn't like, you know, uh, demeaning or anything, but um, people underestimate the Catskills, um, you know, even the resorts. And you can pr learn so many skills here that are going to help you on these big, like, big peaks and like major ski tours. I, like, I promise you that. Don't ever think that something is too small or too insignificant for you to learn something from, because you will learn a lot. Uh, like, I, I just, like, I even skinning up the resort. You know, the, the tremendous improvement that I had from, you know, the first trip I took in August of 2018 to my Airy course um, that February, just from skinning up the resort before I started exploring out there. I mean, I was like, wow, I've really improved. And mm -hmm. I, I think that's kind of like how progress happens. You know, you just keep doing stuff and, and you take every experience you can get and you take every opportunity to get out there and you are going to acquire more knowledge and stuff than people that let's say have been doing it a lot longer but maybe they take like a couple big trips a year or they do it like you know every so often or they're like ah oh, the conditions aren't good or this is too small or why would i want to skin up the resort you're going to gain so much more knowledge so much faster than they are yeah so practical experience. And what, have, what were some of the challenges you like learned along the way, um, and especially unique to the cat skills about uh, on your trails? Um, so 
the so you know like vermont and new hampshire and even like the adirondacks so you know they have like the adirondacks have like slides right so it's like you know open terrain you don't have to worry about like the vegetation as much uh like in vermont you have like that like rasta alliance and like the catamount trail alliance where they like maintain trails like multi-purpose trails and they'll like thin out glades and and things like that mm -hmm. uh you know to make the backcountry skiing like a little bit easier um but the cat skills doesn't have that so you know when i was looking when i was just trying to like bag high peaks here on skis just because i could this season that was the biggest thing so you have it's like all right I can get from, I can ski down from here to there and I can maybe stop myself by grabbing onto that branch. I mean, a lot of it was just like being repeatedly slapped in my mouth by branches and stuff. Then on the, I find that the bushwhack hikes, so a bushwhack hike means that there are no like, uh, like hiking trails on it. Those are kind of like easier to navigate uh like on skis then let's say the ones that are off trails mm -hmm. and then you get these frozen trenches from the people that hike and that can be fine like on the way up you know um like oh somebody already kind of like cut a trench with their snowshoes you know um so that's fun but then on the way down you know you have like this narrow trench where it's like your skis and stuff are like this and you know they have like hairpin turns and stuff so kind of and then outside of the trench it's like such thick vegetation you're kind of like better staying in the trench and it's just like i mean that you can't like open up and just like ski you have to like find a way to maneuver it you know and then like the trench gets frozen and and stuff like that and i found like in some situations like i kept my skis like in uphill mode and my skins on because then it would give me like a little bit more traction and allow me to kind of like maneuver easier. So it's just different ways of figuring out how to deal with kind of like uh, different obstacles that you'll find. It's, there's some sections that can be fun, you know, but a lot of it is kind of like adventure skiing. Yeah. And I want to talk about Fat Map a little bit and how you oh, yeah. use it. Um, can you talk a bit about how that's been helpful for you in plan trip planning or on the on the route or anything that you use it for? I swear to God, I'm not just saying this. I was so excited when I heard that Fat Map was involved in this because you can ask anyone. Like, sorry, my dog is angry at me. Uh, all I do is talk about how great Fat Map is. Okay, can I just let my because there's she's sure. in the Um. <laughs> So uh, when you take your Airy 1 and 2, they will teach you, especially your Airy 1, how to plan a backcountry excursion. Usually they say to use CalTOPO. And the reason why they use CalTOPO is because it you can put different layers on the map that gives you information. So gradient, uh, sun exposure, avalanche danger, things like that. Um, I thought that fat map was a lot more user friendly. Um, I love that it's 3D. I love that I just uh, kind of like, you know, did an update on it. And like, I feel like it's almost like using like Google Earth sometimes. Like you can see it, like the terrain, like so clearly. Like I, I just found like two gullies that I'm like, oh my God, I could actually ski this and have fun and not have to like, you know, be like whacked in the face with like branches and stuff. Um, I love that your phone is a GPS device. So, you know, you're always the red dot, <laughs> you yeah. know, you pull up into the parking lot, you know, put a pin in where you parked. And now, you know, so long as your phone is operating and you should always have a backup uh, method of navigation. So I'm gonna put that out there. But so long as your phone is working, like you will be able to find your way back. So th there's like this feeling of safety and security and it's 3D, so it's not flat. It marks peaks for you. If there are already trails, it marks like hiking trails and things like that. Um, you, I mean, like as someone that's like looking at sun exposure and where things might hold snow, or if I want sun exposure to soften up snow and I can just put that layer on. I mean, backcountry skiers need so much more information to be safe than let's say a hiker does. And there's a big divide 
you know, kind of like in, uh, you know, between hikers and backcountry skiers, because as backcountry skiers, we're trained, you know, to use like, you know, our phones and apps and things like that. And then like hikers are like, you're an idiot. The only thing you should use is a map and compass. And, you know, uh, they're like almost like Luddites about this. Um, but uh, yeah, I just think it's the most user friendly. In fact, um, I ran into some guy on a, the ski tour this past weekend and he was like, oh yeah, you're Julie. And I don't know, he was showing me something on his map where I was trying to tell him like where to go. And he whipped out like Cal Topo on his phone and it was just not as easy and clear to find things. I think I was showing him where like maybe like a defunct ski resort was. And like, it, it was a little harder to find on his phone yeah, on, his, on Cal Topo than like, let's say on fat map. I, I just think it's so easy to use and they, and they're like customer service is great too. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I just, I love it. I really love it. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, cool. And I feel like you've, I've heard you before talk about how backcountry skiing is a year round sport, essentially learning, mm -hmm. you know, on the off season. Can you elaborate on that a little bit too? Um, I'm wondering if other people feel the same. You know, backcountry skiing is a very merit, base sport it takes a lot of um acquiring new skills um and and finding things right so the winter is kind of like when you reap the reward of the research and reconnaissance you've done on the off season so generally what you want to do is like i want to think about okay what might have you know wide trails be the least rocky you know like those are kind of like you know will be more fun to ski um so i kind of like you know uh use the off season to find like all right you know i've researched like the hiking trails and mountains and stuff like that on like you know there's different websites and stuff and i'm like i look for things that might have logging roads or snowmobile trails now that I became friends with snowmobilers, I've realized that they have like this whole network throughout the Catskills of trails. Those are nice wide trails. Um, and then like I go and I hike them and I'm like, okay, this might be fun. That might not be fun. I make a list. I put pins in on my fat map. Um, and then, so if I do that during the summer, I visit it again during stick season. So once all the trees are like, um, sorry, once all the leaves are off the trees, I go back to some of these places and that's going to give me a better idea of what it looks like in the winter. And then like all the like stinging nettles and like the vegetation has died down and I'm like, oh, okay. And then like, I kind of like go back over my list and I, and I kind of like put them in order of like what might be fun. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's, it's, it's work, it's effort. And, but then you feel so proud of yourself. Like, oh my God, look, I found this, you know, like all by myself. Or even like, if you like post about like what you do and people like start like, you know, following your adventures, then people will like think that you're worthy to share information with. And, and, and even it's like those, someone gave you that info. It's the fact that like, they thought you were worthy and had earned it, you know, and and that's cool too. I mean, it's it's really kind of like this this merit based system. So I I, I believe in like uh, giving people the resources to kind of like find um, terrain themselves, and there's a lot of reward with it. Oh, I can't uh, hear you all of a sudden. Oops, there we go. Um, okay. <laughs> what part of the season are you in now? Like, what are you planning now or doing now? Um, and when do you start thinking about next season? Uh, let's see. I'm, I feel like I'm always thinking about next season. But um, so right now, uh, I'm thinking about like, all right, how long can I extend my season? I'm thinking about uh looking at maps right now and and like is there anything that might hold snow or maybe there are these peaks and they're holding snow at the upper elevations and i can you know call up one of my snowmobile friends to like you know drive me up there if i want <laughs> or something um i'm i have like you know a trip in uh the summer plans um but yeah like i have 
like there's more exploring that I want to do of the lower peaks where I think that that might be like fun um, to plan for like, you know, going out next season. Um, so that's what I'm thinking of like right now. And then also like how I can kind of like, one of like my big things I'm thinking about is kind of like how to bring in like more women and people of color and stuff like into the outdoors and the back country and stuff like that. Just because I feel like there's so much less representation that it seems like more intimidating for them to like, kind of like do this. I mean, I know, you know, myself just being like a woman, like, you know, a lot of times I'm like the only like chick among a bunch of dudes. And, you know, like sometimes I'm like, do I belong here? You right. know, um, so if I felt like that, then there are people that I'm sure feel like a lot more intimidated than I have. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. That's awesome. Cool. Um, I'm sure we have some questions coming in, so we're going to get to those in a few a few minutes here. Um, I kind of want to just open the floor up because I've been asking a lot of questions. Anything that you think people should know about yourself or Catskill skiing that I didn't cover? Um, that's a good question. Not at the moment. I think that we hit kind of like the main points and that if you want to explore the Catskills, I would say fire tower routes are a good place to start because those usually um, had either like carriage trails that ride to bring supplies to the summit mm -hmm. or like a Jeep trail, snowmobile trails, uh, mountains that might have logging roads, do a lot of hiking. Like, I mean, I was with some of my snowmobile friends um, like on Sunday evening and we were like, look over there. It looks like there's a bunch of logging roads. So like, you know, I go on my fat map and I like, look, I'm like, oh, that's that peak. And I'm like, okay. You know, and then I might research that peak and see if they're like, where can I park that state land and like climb this peak, you know, and things like that. So is there a, uh, is there a I mean, I think there's always like a corn season. Yes, there's a corn season in the Catskills. <laughs> <laughs> so long as there's melting uh you know and refreezing and melting again you'll you'll get corn snow um how about um can you talk a little bit too about the difference between the res resort skiing in the catskills in the back country and where you're typically um going or differences you see so if you want to be a good skier you need to get resort laps in. You need to practice your downhill. Uh, you're not going to get like, you know, as many downhill laps just doing backcountry. You really need to combine both. Um, but I guess like for me personally, like, especially since, you know, I mean, the Catskills is relatively close to New York City. So we get, you know, very, very crowded resorts. And to me, it's kind of like skiing the resort now is just like, uh, the analogy I would make is it's like what Times Square is to a New Yorker, right? Like, you know, you, you go to Times Square, it's like all crowded and like, you know, just like people don't know where they're going and stuff like that. But, you know, you want to see, you know, a play and do something that you enjoy, you're going to have to deal with those crowds. So, you know, I mean, right now it's good. Like the crowds have, have died down and now like the resort skiing is totally fun. But, um, you know, dealing with the crowds is a necessary evil. But to me, you know, skiing is a way of moving through mountains and exploring mountains. And to me, like backcountry and big mountain skiing is kind of like where the skills in all of these different disciplines kind of like come together, um, you know, and form a big picture. And 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 to me, it's the ultimate purpose of, of being on skis. Awesome. And um, the, we're kind of, I'm checking out some chat here coming in from the audience questions. Um, some people were asking about, the audience wants to hear more about getting underrepresented, pe underrepresented people into the outdoors. Um, uh, what has been your experience so far, you know, engaging with maybe communities that aren't typically in the outside or where do you see that going in the near future in, the, in your area? I mean, I, I think that I'm trying to figure out how to make that happen and find people to kind of like partner with that are equally excited in 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 making that happen um 
like, I mean, there's some people that I'm talking to like on an individual basis, but that, that part I'm still trying to figure out. But I think that one thing that could make people feel more comfortable to do it on their own is that I feel like a lot of people make fun of social media and make fun of people that post on social media. Cause I think they see it as something that's narcissistic and uh, like self aggrandizing. And they don't realize that it can also be used as something that's sharing, giving visibility and giving representation. And, and that's kind of like how I see it. So, you know, if you're a woman, you're a person of color and you're out there like post about it because other people will see that. And then the more people see these things, the less strange it becomes and the more commonplace it becomes. And once it becomes like something that's like just familiar, then people feel like there's less of a barrier in getting out there. And they feel less like, oh, I don't belong there. No, I mean, you see it represented. You see people posting about it. You know, it's right. no longer this strange thing. And I think that on this micro scale, you know, as individuals, if we did more of that, that that would um that would actually make a big difference yeah that's really great insight just like unfiltered look at people and, and what they're doing um i've never really thought about it that way um and what about youth in the outdoors and in specifically backcountry skiing is there like a typical age people can get going or any you thoughts do it any age i've there's a five-year-old girl that just hiked in one season uh she got her winter patch hiking all of the high peaks in the Catskills. she's five years old surely you could put her on skis if she's like <laughs> hanging out in snowshoes you know all winter like it you can do it at any age yeah that's awesome i need to meet this girl i need oh to yeah her name is luna like she, she's amazing <laughs> <laughs> and actually three five-year-olds did it she got uh she because um, there are these like twin boys that did it and they were just like a few months younger than her. So I think that they were technically the youngest, yeah. but you know, yeah, you just get out there with your kids and you do it and you don't need to buy all the equipment like right off the bat. You can just, and I encourage you not to, like people that want to get into backcountry skiing, people are always like, yeah, you need to get like these skis. No, and just go rent snowshoes and like, hike up something and have your skis on your pack with your boots in the binding and ski down. Do you like it? Do you want to keep doing that? Start with that. And then the more experience you get, the more specific your preferences get anyway. So why like go and invest in like all this high end equipment that your buddy told you you should get. And then you find out later, like, this isn't really like what I wanted. Um, now that I have experience and I know what I like and what I want. Yeah. Because then you're like, oh, well, I've already just blown all this money where if I waited a little bit longer, started off in a more like cost effective manner, I could now like afford what I really want. Right. That's such a smart comment. Um, yeah. And probably there's some good like reused gear shops out there and everything that you could probably look at, too. Yes. Yes. I mean, there's I mean, I mean, people can email me, contact me on social media. I can give you like a million options for, yeah. for how you might want to approach things that isn't like, I'm going to drop two grand immediately. And speaking about your advice, we do have one other thought from someone. They said that they love your atypical trip reports <laughs> that you're honestly about suffering has most likely helped them. And um, they were wondering if you were also a writer. I'm not, you know, it's so funny. I didn't become an English teacher because I had any desire to write. I think that people think that like English teachers are all these like, you know, like secretly want to be writers and I never had any desire to do that. I really just loved like analysis and like critical theory. And that's why I wanted to be an English teacher. And I just, I liked telling the story of my day in pictures and that's kind of like how it evolved. And then I still don't get it, why people like it, <laughs> but I'll, I'll keep posting in those groups if you, there are enough people that like it. Otherwise, I'll just keep it to my social media. Um, but I really appreciate it. I think I was I was telling someone, actually, I posted about this, where, you know, my my intensity and my passion for things has always been something that, like, people always saw as a negative thing. They're, like, if I hear my mom say, like, moderation, Julie, like, one more time, or, like, someone that I'm dating or something like that say 
something to that effect one more time, I'm just gonna like explode. But for some reason, um, people really love it in like these ski groups and these hiking groups, they, they appreciate it. So it's really nice to kind of like feel like accepted by someone besides myself, <laughs> you know? Yeah, that's so. good. I mean, you, there's some hiking groups I'm involved in too. I think there's just something about hearing from a peer you can relate to or like um, even stranger, maybe it's more approachable, like just perfect strangers having similar interests and just learning from them online. Um, so I think that like, that's that ability to just share knowledge with people you don't even know is like you're usually reading magazines and seeing pictures of like all of the famous people doing these things that seem so un unconquerable and then seeing hearing somebody who you can relate to probably helps i i think that's an excellent um point because i definitely like you know i am like the everyman of skiing there isn't anything that i've done that you know like everyone can do what i've done um mm -hmm. so I, I think i think that maybe that's something too that's just like all right this is just like your average person who just loves getting out there and and taking every opportunity to to get out there and, and maybe you're right about that yeah so where are some of your favorite places online to learn and share with folks and can they find you online um too i mean the the first place that i post is on my instagram um and then you know, just because like people seem to kind of um, like, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to actually like mix in some useful information along with like maybe like some personal stories or whatever. Uh, so I'll post in like Northeast skiology, I'll post in uh, backcountry skiing in the Northeast and like Catskill trail conditions. Um, Cause I go to those like pages a lot for information because that's like constant up to date information of like what's going on on the trails and on the snow and, and what the weather is. Mm -hmm. um, so I post there, but I mean, I post first to my Instagram and then I post to like those other groups on Facebook. Mm, that's great. Uh, someone was asking who's based in the UK about funding from the government to help people get into the mountains. Uh, is that something you know about? I have no idea because if there was that, that would be something great that I would love to uh, tap into. So yeah. I'm trying to, I'm trying to figure things out with that. I think I've heard more of like maybe, you know, media sites or organizations, maybe funding trips for people, um, especially those who maybe haven't done that themselves yet or don't have the resources to do so. You, you know, it's funny, Sarah and I were talking and she brought up a good point. Like, you know, if there were like, you know, an opportunity, especially to bring like, you know, kids like my students into the outdoors, I want it to be something where then they have like regular access to it. Not like, let's take them out like once, hey, here's the outdoors. And then like, they have to go back to like the right. Bronx and like, they don't have regular access. It's like, here's what you're missing out on and now go back right. home. You know, like you want something where it's like you find a way where they have this regular access to it. That's the goal. Yeah. And I, I have to imagine that She Jumps, the nonprofit that we're supporting today, has some sort of programming like that. Yeah, um, I've, I've, I've tried to, I've, I've, I've contacted them, so I'll wait on uh, a response for that. But yeah. But yeah, so just, yeah, a reminder to folks too that the donations for today's event going to She Jumps, which is really great. And and they are focused on like women and youth in the outdoors. So yes. really timely to a lot of things we were talking about today. Um, Cool. Well, I know we're coming up on our hour here soon. Um, any parting words or thoughts for everybody? Um, well, uh, more to kind of like to highlight like a couple points that I already made. Don't ever think that any opportunity to get out there is too small or too insignificant. Um, it will pay off. And overall, just spending time in the outdoors and also enjoying solitude and that quiet will transform you if you do that on a regular basis like you will gain insight you will gain wisdom you'll gain also like cool experience but it will change you in a positive way and that's why i really think that everybody should have access to it because i think that's why like people pick up on my passion for it is because we understand it and i think that people that aren't passionate out there about the outdoors is because they haven't really been out there like on any sort of like consistent basis. And if they did, they would see the value in that too. Right. 
that's awesome thoughts. Um, and on a less serious note, don't put crampons next to your beer can. In do your not. <laughs> do not. And I have like covers for my crampons still. <laughs> awesome. Well, it's been such a cool opportunity to talk to you. Um, thank you so much for coming on to Mappy Hour today, Julie. Um, if you want to find out more about Julie and her adventures, please travel follow her on Instagram. What do you have your handle offhand, Julie? Yeah, at skin skis, S-K-I-N-S-K-I-S. -S. Cool. Um, and uh, just a few parting notes. Thank you again to Sierra Nevada Brewing for sponsoring as well as Fat Map, which we learned a lot about today and I'm excited to check out. And please join us tomorrow. We have another event coming up with another badass lady out, outdoor person, um, Anastasia Allison, who's an entrepreneur. And she takes her, um, her violin to the top of a mountain and plays music up there and records it. So um, really cool conversation coming tomorrow too um, uh, um, with her group, Musical Mountaineers. So we'll talk to you next time. And thanks again, Julie, for coming on. And we hope to That's see perfect. you out in the Catskills. <laughs> All right, bye everybody.